I mean, you know what? I hit buttons, but I wasn't sure. Hi there. What's up? How's it going? <laughs> Good sunny afternoon to you as well, Alan. Hi from sunny and hot SoCal, Alan. Alan says, it is a little warm today. You are not wrong. I'm dying. It, yeah, we have, uh, we're in the coolest room that we have. <laughs> and it's... <laughs> less warm I guess than the rest of our place which is good which is good so we're gonna try to stick through it and uh, get through as much as is possible but yeah it is definitely a little warm here so we're gonna wait for a few people to jump in and I'll start doing stuff and explaining the things I have my lovely assistant here with me so if you guys have any questions at all please feel free to ask we are reading the chat the whole way through so if there's anything I can answer while um, while we're jamming you just let me know. And, uh... Come on, bring it. Yeah. Oh, I found it. Kind of? I found it. Alright. Oh, hi, Alan. Yeah, 117. It was like 106 here. That. Yeah, it was definitely warm. You know, once you get down, like, down the street to the water, it is a massive difference. <laughs> but, yeah, right here is, um... It's definitely a little, a little warm. Hang on, I'm getting a little bit of lag, so, um, so let me know if you guys are getting any lag. You can see everything. Otherwise, I'm gonna jump right into this guy here. So, I'll just uh, start, uh, start explaining through while, uh, while hopefully the latency isn't too high here. So, one of the, mm, I asked yesterday on Instagram for some suggestions about what to draw but giving me some space to customize something. I didn't necessarily just want to do somebody's vehicle that they owned. I do that all week. Uh, so to be able to do something fun for a live video, I wanted to do something that I could have a little bit of fun with. And I got a few suggestions for a Nissan 240Z. And immediately I thought, let's do something that's um, different than I would normally do. So I went with more of like a 911 Safari Overlander look. I mean, it's not totally Overlandy because it's a little bit more, uh, a little bit more off-road. But this is totally different than something I would normally do on any car. With that, this would be a cool opportunity just to kind of play with some ideas together. A vehicle I've only done a handful of times recently in a totally different style and layout. So uh, yeah, I had a blast sketching this up. And I'm gonna jump right in and start rendering. If you guys have any questions, go ahead and ask. If you've watched any of my videos before, you know I keep a scrap paper here so I can test all my markers, make sure everything's good. But I'm gonna just jump right into it. Today's sponsor is pools. What's that? Today's sponsor is pools. Yes. Everybody get in the pool. Everybody get in the pool. So I'm going to try to get through this one, I'm going to say quick, because sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, I actually always have the intentions of getting through something quick, and I get carried away. <laughs> but it happens. I like all the details you put in already. In the uh, sketch? Yeah. Thank you. Might be like kind of the nature of the style, because it's more of an off-roady vehicle. You know, the tires are going to be a little a little thicker, a little bit meatier, and there's so many, um, like, uh, there's a roll cage on the outside and the inside, and the nerf bars, the straps, the lights. There's a lot more going on in this than something I would normally do, but that's why I asked for suggestions for something I could customize, so I could be a little bit outside the box. If I draw all the same stuff and all the same styles all the time, um, not only will it be boring for me, but it's boring for viewers as well, and I don't mean, like, People won't come and watch my videos. I mean, just general content. People looking for custom car ideas. Um, a lot of the stuff that other designers and artists post might inspire other builders. So we want to think outside the box a little bit. And what I'm doing right now is I'm just taking some light blue and hitting the upper surfaces a little bit. A lot of this stuff will have a little bit of airbrush on it later. But the more I do in marker, the less I have to do with airbrush so I can kind of Plot this out a bit, and I already have kind of a color combination in mind. Naturally, I almost always do. And the way I'm using, obviously, the cool marker. I say obviously. If you're only watching one of these for the first time, maybe it's obvious to me, which is a really silly thing. I'll just go ahead and explain what I'm doing. The cool surfaces are the cool marker that I'm using is to reflect the upper surfaces because the sky reflects blue. 
and the lower surfaces will reflect a little bit warm. So and we'll take all those things into account while we're working. Uh, yeah, so there's a few things that I have to make decisions about while I'm going. And so you might see me work back and forth a little bit, and that's okay. Just kind of the name of the game. So we've got some of this blue, at least enough where I think I'm good. Alan says it looks like your marker strokes blend well. Is that due to the marker brand or the paper or your expertise? A little bit of everything. Um, there, I've never found a marker that made my life easier necessarily, but I do particularly like this brand. This is Chart Pack. They're xylene based. They're a little bit wetter, so they flow better. But true of anything, any marker you use, you have to put the strokes down with a lot more intention. It is marker, so there's really no room for error. Um, so, and the paper also helps. This is Canson Pro Layout marker paper. It's a, it's more of a plate paper, so it's very, very smooth. The markers, I would say, is probably the things that helps the most. It's, it's a very wet marker, but you could, you could, uh, you could get the same effect with any marker. I just, I like these because uh, they help me work a little bit faster, and I prefer to work a little. Um, especially on like quick concept stuff like this where I don't want to spend a ton of time I don't want to spend all day rendering a random idea uh, some days I will again accidentally but it is a combination of, of all the things and as with all things um, the experience of having done this 10 million times is a big part of that as well So now that I've got the upper surfaces cool, I'm gonna warm the lower surfaces because you'll see I'm gonna make the, I'm gonna use the same color on the lower body as the ground, or at least the portion of the ground that I'm gonna do. Um, so that the colors feel a bit more like they reflect each other. There's a few things that I still have to make decisions about as far as colors that I'm gonna wait until I'm a little bit further along uh, to make the decisions about, but there's a lot of this. That's pretty general as far as warm and cools go. We go, oh yeah, I can, I can map that out pretty easily, or, or at least what I think is pretty easily. What I'm doing right here is putting a little bit of blender down first. Are you only putting it in certain areas? Like, why do you decide where to put blender down? Um, I want to go. I want to go past the area that I'm going to put this marker, for example. Okay. Um, so I want to put as much blender in these large areas as possible, so that the marker I'm using has something um, has a ground coat to feather into. I think a lot of people use blender markers incorrectly, and um, this is a bit more as it's intended to be. Okay. If you hear that airplane taking off in the background, it's actually my computer, probably just because it's so warm in here would be my guess. So I'm also going to use the same, this is a, just a warm gray, so uh, to start to plot in some of the background tirey stuff. And I'll probably come up into the tire a little bit, and this might seem sort of arbitrary or whatever, but it'll all make sense as it goes. But even right away, even just with these two colors and these two markers, you can already get a sense of shape and a little bit of value as well. Markers are pretty darn cool, but uh, they can be a little unforgiving at times too, so you have to be you have to be careful and very intentioned about how you're using them. It's about like watercolor; you're putting colors down permanently. You don't have a whole lot of rework space over top in the end. Um, and yeah, for just kind of plotting this out, it's actually already looking really really cool. So let's see, I'm gonna get a little bit of this tire tread in here. I don't want to go too crazy. Um, because a lot of this stuff is going to get buried with black later anyways. So being mindful of some areas do need to be based out initially and some won't, it won't matter. And those types of decisions are definitely like from experience. The stream still looking okay? Yep, you're still doing fine. Alright, the computer is all like, what are we doing? <laughs> yeah, there's there's no airflow happening either, so... Yeah, it probably doesn't help. I mean, the, yeah. the fans are on in the, on the computer, but I actually ended up telling it to stop recording because I was like, well, maybe that's using some of the uh, some of the CPU. And streaming HD does take a lot of data. I don't even know if it's coming up HD or not, but in um, any case... 
Would it say if it's HD or just? just on the streams, I'm not sure because it will do what it. Um, so I kind of put in some parameters, mm -hmm. and then it will do whatever our uh, our bandwidth allows. So if we have enough speed for it to be HD, it will be. And if there's not enough speed for HD, it will just kind of kick it down or get a little bit of lag or something like that. So not the end of the world. So far, so good. Nice. That's good to know. So while I've got the warm gray down, I'm going to add a little bit of, and I'm going to keep a blender out. I'm going to add a little bit of texture to the, uh, to the ground here. Nothing too crazy, but I want, I want the area to feel a little bit less road-like and a little bit more sand or gravelly. And in the case of like a design rendering illustration, something something just like this, you know, we're trying to tell, I don't want to say like a story necessarily in the uh, in the piece, but we're giving the vehicle a purpose at the same time. You know, what is this intended for? If I planted this car down at a, a diner scene, it would be it would be funny because it's interesting and sort of ju juxtaposed, but uh, but not the purpose of the vehicle or the rendering. So a little bit of that kind of rough detail is. Uh, is a little fun and kind of going back and forth with the blender to soften it up a little bit as I go. Sorry if I'm talking really really fast, I'm just trying to keep the information flowing and make sure there's no dead spots. Sometimes when I rewatch these live videos back I'm like, ugh, there's five seconds where I wasn't talking and it's so boring and I hate it. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm gonna grab a sip of water here while this is flashing a little bit. Darshan wants to know, do you use Photoshop for render or you like PS renders? Um, what do you mean by PS renders? I I do use Photoshop, not necessarily for renderings. Obviously, what I'm doing is traditional. This is just marker on marker paper. Um, but I do do digital renderings. This is... I should do a video demo on that alone. Because yeah. there's it's its own thing, and it has its own information, and there's really cool stuff about it as well. So, um, I like a little bit of everything. But I, I love working digitally, actually, especially when I travel for work um, where I'm going out to shops where I'm going to be doing more design, build, rendery stuff. I used to take a full set of markers with me on a plane, and, uh, and it's a really cumbersome way to travel. All right. So a couple of things that I've skipped so far is what I think I might do with the wheel values. I'm trying to keep this one simple so that I can uh, move through it relatively quick. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. I have, I have some ideas for color stuff, but generally, normally I would have based the wheels at this point, just kind of put some tone in it, but I want to get the body tone straight first, and then I'm going to make some decisions about that stuff, because if I'm doing this design, let's say for me, or even if somebody was asking me, I would wait to figure those things out until I've got a sense of some of the basic visuals, so I can make a decision based on what I think the contrast needs to look like um, for those pieces and parts. So, for example, I already know that I'm going to do the body gray, and of course tires have a very tiry look to them, dark gray as well. Mm -hmm. Do I want to end up doing a lighter wheel, or a wheel with an accent color, or a darker wheel, something deeper and darker than the tire? I don't know yet, and at this stage I just want to focus on rendering the body so that I can make that decision on purpose. Uh, he said, I met PS as Photoshop, so maybe other types of Photoshop rendering um, do you use Photoshop for render, or you like Photoshop renders? Still unclear what you're saying, Darshan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I definitely do like digital renders, um, I, and I, I just prefer to work traditionally when I can, but the way that I do digital rendering generally is in a similar type of format as to how I would do it with markers anyways, because I want my artwork to kind of carry, carry the same type of look all the time. As much as possible. I mean, it's certainly been the rules when I can. But it's a cool bit of technology. And uh, it can give you a lot of advantages if you know how to use it correctly. So what I'm doing here is basing out some of these darker core areas. This isn't as dark as the grays will get. But again, because all, all these materials are dye-based, we want to kind of build stuff up. We don't want to get too carried away too quick. So even though I know in the end the gray is actually going to be a bit darker, I don't want to get too carried away just blocking in too much dark. Because um, then I won't end up with something that I can uh, airbrush into. I need to leave some space for the airbrushing to happen. 
And you might notice I'm going the gray over some of the warm tones that I already put in. And that is true. Uh, but because the warm tones are under it as a ground color, the gray has a warm shift to it. So now they're all kind of taking the shape, the color shape of each other. So if you have a, a neutral gray like this and you have a blue undertone or a warm undertone, the gray will take the shape of that naturally as far as the color shift goes in that direction. Right, switch over to another gray and kind of start to bring those down a little bit. I wouldn't normally do so much blending with the markers, but um, I do want to try to keep this one moving along. So I'm going to try to get a little bit more leg work done in here with the markers. And it's the style of the vehicle actually permits a little bit more roughness. And again, I think I mentioned this um, probably in a previous video that it's important, especially with early concept artwork, not to get too hung up too soon. It's important to have fun, but if somebody was paying me to do the design work, uh, you know, they don't they don't want to pay me to spend all day on something that might not be a good idea anyways. So being efficient with time, very very important. And the way that I'm doing lighting and color contour here is just based on experience. Having done a million of these before, knowing kind of where I can put everything so that it makes sense. As far as the way lighting goes around a vehicle and creates shine and creates depth. Are you going to be putting in a background with this one or you don't know yet? I don't know yet. Okay. I generally prefer not to. But um, I also make that decision way further down the road. Just as a, if it's a good way to round out the composition, then I will for sure. And something like this that is intended to be more overlandy or off-roady um, definitely could justify why it would want to be in a, a more of a mountainy scene or something like that. So there's definitely space here to do something really cool like that. So maybe, maybe. All right, let's switch markers real quick. I'm trying to go fast with the markers so that I can work cleanly and blend everything. Sometimes I see artists moving a little bit slowly with markers and it's a, it's a tool that really requires a lot of confidence. So be deliberate, but you know, follow through. And uh, switch markers and I'll start to plot this interior in a little bit more. We've already got a great amount of shape happening, which is really, really cool. That's one of the reasons I actually like um, rendering some ideas just in grays. But we'll, you know, we'll get a little warm shift, a little bit of cool shift, but you still get all the shape and the contrast, which is cool. Poor computer. It's okay, computer. Hang in there. It's going to be all right. We're all hot. Yeah. Just plotting a little bit of the interior in there, and then just kind of getting these shapes to help the flow and shape of the vehicle as well. And there's still be quite a bit of airbrushing, so I need to be I need to leave myself some space for that. But I want to get these the contrast to some of these lines as close as possible, so that I don't have to do a ton of airbrushing. I mean, I want to use the airbrush to soften up some of these areas and make some of these blends a little bit better. Uh, but other than that, you know, I'm trying to get this marker to do as much as it can. So what's everybody else up to today? I'm sure after this I will definitely be wanting some like ice cream or something. <laughs> it is warm. Yeah. I need to bring an umbrella this time. To, uh... Just for shade. Yeah. It's not a bad idea. All right, so... So, jamming, we got some good shapes going on here. And now that the contrast is starting to balance a little bit better, I want to maybe come over some of these areas a little bit more. And 
And what makes kind of shape and shading is a mix of soft shapes and hard edge shapes, really more the edges. So these high contrast areas like this will give us a better sense of shine. Alan says he's trying to stay cool and learn something. Nice. So you have AC, I am assuming. <laughs> Lucky you. Yeah, our coastal places rarely have AC. and It's only a few weeks out of the year that it would be helpful, but this is one of those weeks. <laughs> Yeah, it's a little rough. My GTI burned my finger yesterday. <laughs> Just getting something out of the trunk. <laughs> That's certainly a bummer. Alright, so from here, I've got a decent amount of body shape, but I've got plenty to where I know I can bring some airbrushing into. I'm going to take my warm gray and come over some of these areas again. Sometimes when you work marker into marker a lot, you'll lose a little bit of saturation or you'll lose a little bit of, uh, of that color. So you want to kind of come back in and make sure, make sure that you're still getting it and maybe plot in some new areas that didn't have some before, just so you get a good color balance. So I'll do color balance is what I meant to say. And I'll do the same up top, make sure we're getting some of that blue up here. And all this could be treated with airbrush and more or less will be. But again, the more I do with the marker, the less I have to do with the airbrush. And trying to be a little bit more efficient on this one um, than some of the demos I normally do. What's happening? Uh, Rashawn wants to know how much you spend on markers altogether. Oy. <laughs> we don't buy them all together. It's like a gradual yeah, thing. Yeah, it's accumulative. You know, over time, you need, like, I'll just pick up this, this guy over here real, real quick. Like, this is just one of the travel pads that I travel with. Um, and this is a fraction of what I have. This is just kind of basic markers that cover a lot of ground for the average stuff that I do. I have an entire toolbox over here full of markers and tools. Um, because the reality is you need one of everything eventually. Uh, but cost-wise, I couldn't say. But the, uh, the absolute right answer is that it's accumulative. You don't you just go out and buy a thousand markers all at once. You certainly could. Um, and I think there was a point where I bought 200 or so all at once. And it was actually a big help. I was glad that I had so much. Because, uh, I mean, really you need it. Uh, but because also I do a lot of airbrushing, I don't, I don't need it quite as much because I'm not going to rely on markers to do everything, which is a nice plus. But if I'm out traveling at a shop or something like that, it is a little bit simpler to have the markers than carrying the airbrush and everything like that, which you can do, and sometimes I do, especially if I want to seem like a superhero. All right. So we are jamming here. I like it so far. Yeah, it's actually looking really, really cool. Even as a basic idea, it has uh, a loose concepty feel, but it's not bad. Um, the next thing I'm actually going to do is start to block in these like a bumper and nerf bars and the roll cage that's coming over the top. That's probably difficult to see because it's just a single line. And it's the one thing that I actually want to do that's going to be a drop of color on this particular uh, vehicle. So as just, I like a drop of color, or at least the way I say it is drop of color, because it becomes kind of a point of interest. So let's see here. And I already know that I'm going to go a bit darker on the gray, but like I said, i got to leave myself some space to airbrush in the transitions, and I'll be able to bring the color down with the airbrush a lot easier than up, so I'd rather have a good mid-value going and then airbrush the rest of it down. So I'm going to do all the bars in a gloss red, just because it'll be kind of a fun standout detail in something that's otherwise a bit simplistic. Or maybe I'm wrong, maybe it's not that simplistic. And Sean said, yeah, I did one illustration and it cost 200 euros, but it was worth it. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely not a cheap thing, getting markers and such. Was it just on markers that you spent 200 euros, or was that included with uh, other supplies? Uh, there, Sean. I'm, I'm just, I'm curious. Ooh, I like that. Is that red or orange? It's, uh, it's actually right in the middle, so it's a red-orange. Ah. And I thought it would be kind of a cool complement to the entire thing. I like it. Just, um, because this is going to be basically a dark gray, or, yeah, a dark gray, 
Um, you know, a little bit of color goes a long way as like a, a poppy detail. It's almost like the pinstripe of a vehicle. It does something to tell some of the story. But if everything is kind of monochromatic, then it's a little bit boring. And to me, this is it's an unusual design for me to be doing something like this in the first place. Um, but I don't want to compromise the coolness by making it boring by playing it safe. Just on markers, wow. Good lord. I mean, I guess at some point if you need them, then if you're starting from having none, then yes, they will be very, very expensive. But now you have them, right? Hopefully they last you for a while. Yeah. Well, they should if you take care of them. Actually, almost sounds like an, an engine. Yeah. Computer. Yeah, it sounds like an airplane taking off. All right, so I know I've got a little bit of that tube cage going on the inside as well. A lot of that will get covered, but it's important that the ground colors are there because even if they get covered and they get darker and a little bit buried, it's better than trying to add them in later because uh, then you're adding paint detail on top, and it'll just take on a completely different look. All right, let's see if I can grab a little piece of paper here. Okay, this shade of gray and other pencils. Wait, how many shades of gray did you get? I mean, I guess if you were to buy a set of grays, <laughs> you would end up with 10 at least. Yeah, at least. Uh, I almost know what exercises would you recommend to practice before learning reflections, blending, etc. A good thing to do would be to um, study a lot of references and understand a little bit about how light contour and color flash works. And, um, but what I think is probably a good way to even do that in a bit more depth is study references of cars uh, shot in um, uh, a photo studio or something that's super, super clean. There's a few magazines that inherently have really good studio shot vehicles. And what that does when you look at the photos of that, sometimes they appear a little bit less glossy because the, um, the information is simplified, but what it does is remove all the BS out of the reflections. There's no trees, there's no kids playing in the park, there's no cars surrounding it. Those things are interesting and kind of make a shadow shape look, but they're also a huge distraction. Um, and I think I mentioned that in the last video, like, you know, leave the kids in the park out of the photo or the drawing or the reflections rather, because you just, it's not a point of interest. It shouldn't be something that the reflections focus on, unless it's in the scene, unless you're rendering all of that stuff. But So I like looking at photos of vehicles that have been done in studio settings because you get a clean sense of how color and lighting work without being distracted by all the BS. All right, so we faced out all the red areas. I actually don't really need to do much else with this. Um, so I actually might come in with a little bit of pink, which I don't often do some of the shading with, uh, with the next value marker, but I'm going to kind of keep things moving here. And I really don't want to overdo it. I just want to hit a couple areas really, really quickly. Because um, when you're making marker shapes, you're essentially... You know, some of these cut lines and the way the shape and flow of the lines work gives you a sense of gloss. Um, so you don't want to bury it with transitions and try to blend everything super, super nice. You need some of the harsh lines and you need some of the soft lines. So learning how to balance those is very, very important. It's a little simpler if you have a perfect reference to work from because then, then there's a lot less guesswork, obviously, which is great. But something like this... It doesn't exist. I, I drew this entire thing from scratch, so, so there's not an overlay from a photo I was able to take or anything like that. And I'm not saying that as a, a superhero -y thing, but this vehicle doesn't exist. So, of course, I have to draw it from scratch. Um, and ultimately, I'm lighting it from scratch as well. This is part of the fun. But if you had a perfect reference, it would save you a lot of the guesswork. That's for sure. But even with a perfect reference, I would say, still, leave some stuff out. Know, know what makes sense for your artwork and what doesn't.
All right, so we've got some of the basic stuff going on there. It's actually looking pretty good. I'm gonna grab, actually, this is a seven. Switch over to a five. And add a little bit of value to these guys as well. So they have some shape. As Arshan said, 10 cool gray, 10 warm gray, 10 neutral gray. Jesus. And now I have a render, have to render my sketches in Photoshop as now a Nowadays, my college demands it. Yeah, that's... Yeah, distance learning. Hmm. Well, and it's also um, a little bit more contemporary. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. not really common for design studios to do a lot by hand uh, on paper. They're still doing it by hand using, like, drawing tablets and stuff like that. Um, that's kind of how we end up with the most questions about how to draw on paper and render with markers because a lot of the students that message me, this isn't being taught in their classes. And it makes sense. This isn't, you know, this is really, really old school. There's not a whole lot of practicality behind it. Think about the cost of markers even. Why would you spend so much money on markers as a professional if you could just have one program that has all the stuff in there for you? Yeah. So it's a no-brainer. Um, but I personally like a little bit of both, and a lot of builders I work with like to know that they're getting something physical that's real in the end. Not always the case. Not everybody cares that much about those things. So the, you know, the answer almost always is there's not one way to do everything all the time. You should never be so stuck in your ways uh, that everything has to be done this way or this way. You know, you got to leave yourself some room to move with the times too. Mm -hmm. And that's something I actually struggled with a bit early on. So, so I get it. <laughs> So what I'm doing here is I'm taking a darker gray value and bringing that core color down just a little bit more. I said I know how much space I want to leave for airbrushing and I actually have a ton of space to airbrush which is awesome. Um, but I typically don't do any masking when airbrushing concepts like this so if I can get some more legwork done here with the markers and the inks I certainly will. some of these nice harsh reflections which give this feeling of a uh, gloss or depth as we go and I tend to want to try to concentrate some of the high contrast stuff uh, visually a bit closer and let the ends be a little bit softer so you know right in the middle is where I want to get some of the uh, harshest stuff happening uh, but nothing is fun and beautiful as markers and hand sketch you are right Darshan it's definitely something really special though like I said they a lot of the builders that I work with like the physicality of having something in the end to give to their customer or hang on their wall. That's not the answer for everybody, um, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there, there's definitely something super, super special about it. There is definitely something really frustrating about not having that color marker that you needed that day or, or something like that. Um, I wanted to go and get a different paper to use yesterday for this oh, yeah. demo, and weren't able to do that, so, you know... <laughs> If I was doing this digitally, a lot of that stuff wouldn't matter anyways. There was a lot of traffic yesterday. We were like, nope, we're not sitting yeah, in pass. this. Yeah. Um, Alan said, yeah, but the hand-drawn art has so much character. Love it. Yeah, it, it does. I try not to downplay the significance of digital artwork because um, I love it and I love so much about it. Um, and But better and worse is relative, you know? I will say, like, as a video or as something I'm posting on social media, there is definitely something more special about watching somebody actually draw something, for sure. And working digitally, even when I work digitally, um, you know, I have a drawing tablet, something that's pen on screen. You're still drawing. You're still doing it by hand. So it's not any easier. Not really. <laughs> um, you just have direct access to a lot more tools, which is a good thing. This is looking really, really cool. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stop and take a sip of water here. I'm going to come through my shirt a little bit here. <laughs> Sweat. No one can see. You can take your shirt off. No one can show you. I know. I thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see. So I want to darken up a couple of areas before I jump in the tires and wheels because I do want to do those before I do any airbrushing. Um... 
just kind of keeping an eye on the markers I'm using so I can kind of plot the values the same way uniformly. Yeah, for a color like this, that will end up being a lot of airbrush. Well, I say a lot, not like a ton of airbrushing, but I'm going to bridge the gaps of so much of what's happening here with airbrush. Um, and it'll be great because it'll soften some of this stuff up. A lot of the, like you probably can't tell in this exact version or the way the video quality looks. When you do a lot of marker blending, it almost doesn't matter what kind of paper it is, it will tend to get a little bit grainy. And that's because the solvents and the inks are working together. And the more you work over top of them, they actually start to remove what's underneath. And it's not interfering with the paper necessarily, but the inks are uh, what I call put uh, put down, oh, I have it. yeah. Muddling my words at the moment, but you remove ink as you put ink down. Yeah, I don't know what that was. There's a yeah, there's a phrase I have for it, but the temperature in here is incredibly distracting, so I can't. It's not coming to my brain right now. So real quick, I'm going to take a slightly darker gray and plot some of these little detail areas that may or may not come across on the screen. One of the details was the fenders have a little bit of cutout and scoop around the, um, the flared arches so that the wheel areas can breathe a little bit, maybe cool off the brakes or just allow more dirt to go across the car, whichever. Um, and also the way I have this seam drawn, I was kind of imagining an entire lift off hood front end. Just, just a fun detail. When doing something like this, it's important to kind of let your imagination run. to Art Supply Warehouse in Westminster or Artists and Craftsmen Supply in San Diego? Well, San Diego, well, neither one of those places are exactly close to where we live. Um, so some of the stuff I'll try to get at uh, Laguna Beach Art Supply. That's the closest to us because they have some really cool traditional stuff. And some of it I do get from Art Supply Warehouse in Westminster. If I'm driving up there, i got to come with a list of stuff because uh, it can be so distracting going to an art store that does spell, sell specialized stuff when you kind of forget what you're even there for because everything is awesome. Um, and then sometimes we'll go down to San Diego and we'll just go to Blick because they've obviously got stuff on the shelf, shelf as well. But by the time I'm going to a store to get materials, I already know exactly what I need. I've got a list of stuff. So, yeah. When we first moved here, we there's a there was an art store down the street, but yeah. they went out of business last year. Yeah, that was a bummer. I think they retired or something, yeah. and yeah, they were done. <coughs> yeah, yeah, that was one of the great things when we moved here. I was like, hell yeah, there's a um, an indie, like mom and pop owned, art supply place. And the really cool thing about that, generally, is that they sell stuff that nobody else does. And that was the case. <laughs> Um, they had these chart pack markers, they had some unusual illustration papers. So to be able to go down the street to get art materials is a blessing. And that's not the case now. Yeah. They're closed, so now it's a bit more of an event to go and get materials. But it's alright. Live and learn. So I'm starting to color in the tire that's sitting on top of the roof here. And it's going to have a little bit of depth and a little bit of texture. Um, because it should be a little bit chunkier, but I need a, a base tone to begin with, and while the marker's wet, I can kind of give it a little bit more shape, and it'll kind of give a little bit more airbrushy look. While marker is wet, you can keep working into it, and it'll blend to itself, but it will feather, and especially depending on the paper, you have to be careful so that you don't get too carried away. So that's looking really cool. side view mirror in there and even though you know I got the seats drawn in here they basically just need to be implied that they're there there'll be a lot of airbrushing and tone that goes over them but leaving them out all together like even though these details will show like five percent maybe not very much but if you leave them out it can just seem like it's a hollow empty car that's missing stuff so we don't want that either all right, so the next thing I'm going to do is actually block out the tires, and then I'll make a decision about how I'm going to do the wheels. So let's just jump right into it. Find a marker tone that I want to use. Always test your markers on a spare paper first. 
That one's a little bit dry for what I want, so I'm gonna have to find another one. What are we laughing about over there? Me? Yeah. Oh, I thought there was I something funny. I was supposed to laugh at too. But we, we already jumped right into it. So let's continue jumping right into it. Oh my and so we kept jumping. Let's see how this guy looks. That is a lot wetter. This is, uh, these are the same type of paper, Canson Pro layout mark paper, so you can tell. There's no, no bleed through on the back, which is why I'm able to test this and not get any, any show through. Mm -hmm. Alright, so I've got some of the detail for the tire sketched in, and thankfully I kind of already have plotted out areas I know I need to avoid. And this is a reduced marker, so it is super, super wet, so i got to be careful. Kind of slowly work around the wheel. If I go too slow, it'll feather and bleed into the wheel. It is a little bit because, like I said, this is a, a reduced marker, so it's very wet. And my dogs are barking at something. Do you want me to go check on them? I'm sure it's just the mailman. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so just kind of want to fill this area a little bit. It is feathering a little bit on me, so I'm probably not going to use that same marker. <laughs> I'm not going to use the same marker for the rear because, actually, I'm going to go ahead and put a cap on it and throw it in the trash. Yeah, that's the trash over that way. The marker is too wet, so it feathered too much. And that, um, <laughs> you think wetter w would be better for the markers? It's actually not. It'll really make you work hard. So, I have to let that dry, and I'll just come back in to this side and use a different marker. But hey, live and learn. Yeah, Lucy's being silly. What's she doing? Yeah, Ellie's still where we left her. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> she's cool. Um... Uh... On your test sheet, how did you blend the green and yellow together? That's a marker and then airbrush over top. Ah. That was for a live demo I did at Coast Airbrush earlier this week. Um, so I'll, I'll do a lot of the initial blending with markers, and then I'll come back over it. Uh, Rashawn said, dude, your beetle really loved it. The um, drawing or the car that I have? Like the, oh, that, yeah, that's a good question. We do have a couple beetles, and you know, Chris actually has a roaster beetle uh, that he loves. Yeah, it's my everyday car. So, we we are a very uh, VW family here. Yeah, we have a bunch of German cars. It seems kind of intuitive because they specialize in like hot rod design, but yeah, <laughs> we're allowed to like a thing. Yeah. Absolutely, especially if it's better. <laughs> so I'm doing the marker tones here kind of quick. And I'm covering up what would be considered some of that initial pen stuff. I'm going to end up coming back and doing the detail a little bit differently. I tend to rearrange the order I'm going to do details based on a number of factors. And in this case, let's say a chunkier tire. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the details by hand a little bit later instead instead of uh, leaving some of the paper white. Sometimes that works, but in the case of this, seeing that I need to bump the contrast a lot more means I'm just gonna treat this a little bit differently. And I don't do a ton of chunky tire stuff, so that means I have to do this a little bit differently than I would anyways. Uh, I think he's talking about your roadster. He oh. said a uh, car, the one you showed in the vlog. Ah, uh, yes. That would be my everyday car. That's his baby. And we went all the way up north to get that that car. It was a long drive. Very long drive. All right. So tires are definitely looking messy. It's sort of nature uh, pieces and parts of what I'm doing here, but that's okay. And let's see. I'm gonna grab a little bit of gray and kill down some of these areas. I don't want so much bright to battle later. And 
course, I need to give myself some space to airbrush into something. And the airbrush colors are kind of like the marker colors, obviously, or not obviously, I don't know. They are, uh, they're acrylics, but they're transparent, just like markers are. So, you know, we're constantly building down to darker colors as opposed to bringing colors up. Colors can start to look really washed out if you start putting lighter colors over darker colors. So there's a time and place where that could work. Uh, this traditional illustration on paper, it's, it's smarter to think about the, uh, the undertone of the paper as part of the artwork that you're doing. I'm going to kind of get a little more contrast in the ground here. There's a few markers I can tell I need to replace. Sound aside so you know which ones are which. Yeah, I just threw one away. Aww. Yeah, that was bad. Whew. All right, grab. Value here and start to create a little bit more contrast. I need to blend these areas in a little bit. Um, but yeah. yeah let's ruler, a lot of this stuff all freehand, but there'll be a couple of details that are going to be a little extra tight that are just like, let's just. Just make sure that this is right instead of just trying to throw a marker at it and trying to get it to fit. There we go. So I tend to do like an outline first and then fill into that because the marker will will uh, bleed into itself really cleanly that way. And I wish I had a better. There's a couple of values here that I'm missing as far as. Uh, Marker tones go, which is a bit of a bummer. Mm -hmm. It'd be super helpful right now. Um, but I haven't been doing as much travely work stuff, so um, it hasn't been a need to restock these because a lot of the build stuff that I've been doing lately is digital anyways. And that's definitely a pretty dry marker there. So just kind of going back and forth, building a little bit of shape and tone over what I already have. And also trying to make it dynamic at the same time. You know, I don't want to just, I want to make this as interesting as possible. And you're succeeding there. Oh, I hope. Like I said, there's, I'm missing a bunch of markers right here. Uh, Alice says, fun tidbit, tidbit, oh my gosh, on micro long, longevity. I have a few markers that still work that were bought in 1969. Ooh. Guess they don't make stuff like they used to. I would say not. Yeah. <laughs> um, chemical makeup is a big part of that. You know, most of what's considered contemporary markers now are uh, alcohol or water-based. And they are great markers, but they, they have kind of their own things happening, too. They're not going to be perfect for everything. They're not going to last forever. Light fast ratings are different. So all kinds of stuff. Coming back in with a little bit of warm, too. Get a better glow in here. Cause we'll lose some of the saturation while we're going over it with grays. And we'll bounce these lower areas a little bit more aggressively. You know, if I'm resaturating the ground, I want to make sure I'm resaturating everything a little bit. At least the lowest stuff, the stuff that has the most color bounce. Going over the red a little bit more, make sure I don't have any holidays. Get the most out of the saturation in those little bits. And again, I'm trying to move through this one fairly quick. You're, you're doing good. Because it is quite hot in here.
cool. A lot of the shape stuff will come back with uh, the way that the highlights are done. So the next thing that I'm going to do is, I guess I could block out the main wheel value that I was thinking of. Let's see, we'll start with something a little bit lighter. Like a three. And they'll end up being darker. Again, it's another area where there's going to be a bit of airbrushing. But I want to get the base down, and while it's wet, I can do those couple of passes like you saw. And so while that's drying, because we're getting to the part where I can start to bring in some airbrush, and I've already got some colors mixed up over on the side here. Nice. So while that's drying, I'm going to block in some of these cutout areas here, so that when I am airbrushing, I'm airbrushing into these blocks. You could do some of the marker afterwards, and sometimes I will, but um, it's smarter to get as much of this out of the way as possible. I'm just kind of outlining these little areas so I can cut out the grills. And the airbrushing will probably go a long way in this one because there's so much marker here. So it may or may not appear the way on screen, but it'll have a lot of um, a lot of streaking. And it's sort of a marker look, but I don't I don't want it to be all streak all the time. Why does that make it look not great? Or to me, I don't like something that's overly streaky. There does need to be a little bit because uh, you get a sense of gloss and flow but something that reads natural will have a mix of hard shapes and soft shapes. Oh, okay. So, yeah, some stuff that's all marker to me doesn't look super great. And by that I mean, like, my way of doing it probably isn't, isn't super great. If I needed to do something quick and be done in a few minutes, I'm not going to waste any time with an airbrush. I'm just going to do as much of it as I can with marker. And that is okay. Okay. But if, uh, but if I've got time, I definitely want to do some airbrushing. So that the uh, so I can get the best out of everything. All right, so we're doing good here. Yeah, you're doing really good. Good, thank you. Just gonna outline some of these details. I'm gonna come back in later with a pencil or paint. And stuff. All right. So let's see. grab that same dark color again and start to do some of the undercolor, or at least bottom of the car here where it tapers under. Alright, alright. I'm going to sure up a couple of edges. And then, real quick, I'll put in, I'll do the wheel spoke cutouts. Or actually, what does she do? Unless I grab the correct marker to do so. Is make sure the dish of the wheel has a little bit more depth than the face. So that they feel like they're on different planes. Because, well, they are. A lot of this will have to be airbrushed and, and paintbrushed back in. Because of the way that some of the marker happened there. But that's alright. Part of the professional process of doing illustrations and renders is also being able to manage your mistakes, knowing how to solve some of the problems that come across in using these materials. Because not everything is going to go perfect all the time, and uh, and that's okay. And matter of fact, it's more than okay. You should expect <laughs> that things aren't going to go perfectly all the time, so that you can be keenly aware of adapting. And uh, being and problem solving really on the fly, it's really really important. There's always be some marker that's too wet or too dry or don't have that color, and you know your client's waiting on you for for a concept. They don't, they don't want to hear that you're out of something. That's for sure. <laughs> they just don't understand. Yeah, yeah, they're not really gonna want to wait. Mm -hmm. All right, so. While I've got this guy out, I'm going to grab a couple of these tire details real quick. I'm 
And a lot of this we'll read a bit more with a bit more depth once the highlights are being done, but that's like way, way down towards the end. We're just not there. Well, we're making progress, but we're not at that stage yet where we need to be so focused on details just yet. All this stuff is like loosely blocking in stuff to start, uh, start to get shapes. All right. So. Alan wants to know if you draw other subjects besides automotive art. I sure do. Um, I do. So I have a, like a robot series of artwork that I really enjoy. And I've done some paintings of my dogs. I mean, I can, I can really paint and draw anything. I'm just, I love cars. So it uh, certainly makes sense why I, I do this. But yeah, sky's the limit, I think. I'm not, I'm not afraid to paint or draw anything. This is just the stuff that interests me the most. Sean says, yeah, that's the game of managing the space. Exactly, exactly. It's a huge part of, of uh, any type of illustration. Even if you're working digitally, yeah. you're not going to be making perfect strokes uh, and picking perfect colors all the time. Same on paper, same as it is digitally. You have a little bit more room for error digitally just because you have some layers and some backup space, which is good. It means ultimately you should end up at a better result because you have the space to make those corrections at least a bit more efficiently. Um, all right, I'm just going to do the cutouts. Actually, I should do that next. One last thing before I break out the airbrush. I've already got colors pre-mixed, so that'll save me a few minutes there. But I'm going to get these guys cut out first. When I was sketching the wheel for this one, I wanted to come up with something that was simple uh, but utilitarian. I'd sketched a different wheel first, and then I was like, no, nah, that's too, a little too sporty for something that's going to be off-road. So it came to something a little bit simpler, a little bit more steel wheel-like. And I'll probably end up going pretty deep gray on the wheels. Um, but I want to make sure I have some base tones to start with. Sean wants to know when you started sketching cars. I started sketching cars when I was in elementary school. I uh, remember when I was in first grade, I, one of my art project was a drawing of my grandma's car. She had, I think it was an 88, 88 or 86-ish Toyota Celica GT. And I still remember that drawing. Probably crayons on newsprint. Um, but yeah, I've been drawing cars for a long, long time. I haven't been doing it professionally nearly as long. I've had other careers, <laughs> but I'm happy, very happy to be doing this. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, and I like a lot of the builders that I work with because um, they have interesting challenges. So I gotta try to stay for another conversation. Oh, it's all good. I'm actually just about to grab the airbrush, so Yay. so we'll get some really cool stuff out. We're almost an hour in. I'm not 100% sure that we're going to finish this one in stream. Um, you know, just kind of depends. Sometimes I don't get all the way to the detail area at the end. Um, I do see something I do want to do, though. Before we get to, there we go. I've got a basic gray here. I like a little bit of this kind of purpley tone towards the bottom a little bit. When working with markers, you have to take into account value and color and saturation all at the same time, which is, that's why I say a bit more like watercolor, except watercolor can be very, uh, very reversible, which can be a good thing, or... It can? I didn't know that. What's that? But you can be reversible with watercolor. Watercolor is entirely reversible. Whoa. Like, you can remove watercolor off of a watercolor painting with water. Yeah, that's what this is. Even though it's dried and everything? Dry doesn't mean anything in watercolor or gouache. The nature of the material is that you can continuously move it around. That's how you end up with such soft blends and stuff like that. Um, acrylic watered down acts like watercolor, but dry is permanent. Totally different thing. Watercolor material itself isn't like continuously movable, which is a good thing. You can get a lot of really, really cool effects working with it. Um, 
you know, as long as you know that. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to grab the airbrush, and the first thing that we're going to do, assuming this guy wants to work with me today, <laughs> nothing makes stuff not fun like the tools not working correctly. So, first thing we're going to do is going to grab some blue. So much of this is going to get airbrushed so I can uh, end up with a cleaner look like I want. Airbrushing is about to commence. Okay, so I basically I'm move some of this paper so it doesn't go flying around. Basically, going to go over a lot of the areas that I already have. And you might think, well, couldn't you just do this with marker? And technically, the answer is yes. But as I alluded to earlier, the more marker over marker you do, the more you start to remove the marker that you're going over. So you start to get this grainy look. And if it's uniform, I guess it's not so bad, but I don't find it to be personally attractive myself. So softening this stuff up really helps. Plus, marker saturates into the paper. So it's going to dry and it's going to die back just slightly, so slightly less saturation. Airbrush ink is going to sit on top of the paper, on top of the marker. So it's actually going to be more saturated, and it's, it's airbrush after all. It's going to be smooth as it gets. I'm trying to do light passes, be really deliberate about what I'm doing. Because if you go too heavy with airbrush on paper, especially, paper is very thin, especially marker papers, you can warp it to death. And um, you definitely don't want that, and it will make your life harder when you're trying to paint details later. Because if the paper's not flat, then all your hand painted details later will also suffer the same problem. Oh man, years ago. We, we've had this actually. We're building a little more attention on YouTube. Yeah. I think I posted my first YouTube video in 2010 or 9, uh, which seems like an eternity ago. And it was before I was doing artwork full time. I was still working in body shops, I'm still a paint and body guy. And at those times, the only videos that I had, which are the oldest ones that are up here, are the Sharpie cars from that era. Um, but, yeah, as my wife said, you know, I didn't really take YouTube seriously, and we're just now starting to try to give some serious attention to it, um, as we get a lot of questions related to technique and materials, and people kind of want to see how this artwork comes together. It is really, really interesting to watch, um, or at least I say that now. I thought, I thought for the longest time that watching this would be super boring, uh, so I was, I was resistant to it for quite a while, um, but... It doesn't make me right. So, I'm trying to get this blue a little bit deeper. I'm going to airbrush into it as well. Um, but yeah, just trying to get a good balance here. So the next thing I'm going to do, let's see, because I want a little bit of blue up here. So the way it's looking at my end, it looks very stainless steel color. That sort of makes sense, because the contrast is the blue richness is, oh yeah. <laughs> It's very rich right now. But not in a bad way. I'm not I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going to bring it down a little bit with some uh, with some other tones. But, yeah, I'm just going to find the airbrush cap, switch out colors. Just give me just a second here, guys, while I clean out the airbrush and switch over to gray. So, um, oh. can you go check on the doggos. See? So I tend to pre-mix colors before like live videos or demos so that I have to spend a whole lot of time mixing colors um, during this because that would be just boring to watch. But I do the same thing when I'm doing work for customers. Um, I come up with a set of materials that I know I'm going to use. I get everything set out, test the markers, test the paints, mix the paints, so that once I'm in it, I've got nothing else to do but sit there and focus on the artwork. So, sorry, just making a little bit of a mess here. So the next thing, now that I've got some gray mixed up here, I'm going to come into this core color a little bit and just bring it down a little bit. It is a very dark gray. Um, you might have seen when I tested it, it almost seems black, but it's actually, it is actually gray because I do have a little bit of white mixed in with it. And I could probably just do like a transparent gray, um, or transparent black rather, 
but I didn't want it to have that type of look. It's another thing that just sort of comes with experience a little bit of kind of going. If you're using transparent black, you're going to get rich and dark spots that are very hard to balance out later on. I will use transparent black, just not for this stage of what I'm doing. And I generally don't use any masking when I'm airbrushing these quick concepts because I don't want to waste time. And um, I did airbrushing professionally for many years before I became an artist full time. So I have decent habits about preventing massive amounts of overspray happening. So it's kind of going to go over some of our lower body colors here. Start to transition some of these areas. I don't want to overdo it. But I do want to start to bring the contrast around. Get a little bit of shape into these scoops here. So that's a huge reason about why I like the airbrush over markers. Because I can really start to soften up the look. Um, I'm sure there's talented people out there that can blend markers to get an airbrush look. But I think ultimately when you do that, you end up with a grainy mess, um, which is just not my thing. I'm sure plenty of people could probably care less, but I don't like when it has that look to it. So coming over the top surfaces now a little bit with the same gray. It's important when you're doing something, let's say airbrush over marker like this, that the, all the color family starts to look like uniform. If I leave the upper surfaces too blue or the lower surfaces too yellow, then you start to read like um, very inconsistent on the entire thing. So if I'm going to go over the grays a little bit, then I need to go over all the grays. So if there's a little bit of color shift, that, that it's everywhere and not just in some places. Just kind of doing a little bit of a time so that I'm not warping the paper and so that I give myself an opportunity to step back and look and make sure that things are balancing the way I want. I could actually go a lot richer on the top surface here. So I'm going to. And I probably actually will have to do that with black because I think the gray has reached about its capability here. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, good. Uh, asking, yeah, what's the game of managing mistakes? On paper, <laughs> It's uh, a little bit about not freaking out. <laughs> um, I don't, wouldn't even really know where to start with something like that. Because there's a bunch of different ways that mistakes can happen. Obviously. And uh, just kind of taking it in stride is the best first step. You know, just assume that not everything's going to go perfect. Not that you're looking for problems to happen. But be good at managing mistakes. Just... The stress of it will be worse than anything, so don't let it stress you out. Just be proactive in, uh, in problem solving. And practice, too. Like, just have scraps of paper lying around and, yeah. you know, if you make a mistake on that, it's a little bit. Yeah, exactly. That's a really good point. So that's why I always have a scrap piece of paper to make sure the airbrush is functioning correctly or, or whatever. Of course, still going to end up with weird little issues here and there, and that's okay. Ultimately, we just want those to be smaller mistakes and not bigger mistakes. Just kind of drop shadowing these little buckles here. Make a good little tone into these guys. A lot of this will come back up with um, with the highlight work but I just kind of want to make sure everything feels balanced at this point. And I do still have some airbrush tones to get in here, so this isn't, this isn't it. I'm just trying to balance everything. But got a good look going so far. I'm going to airbrush these tubes just a teeny tiny bit so that they have a little bit more round shape to them. A lot of that will come up with the airbrushing or the uh, highlights later as well. 
But like I said, I kind of want to touch a little bit of everything so that all this stuff feels like it's from the same family. And that little bit of overspray that I'm getting is actually going to help me with some of the detail stuff later. Freehand a little bit of this tire tread. Not too much. But just enough, hopefully. All right, and actually I kind of want to make a pass over the entire wheel here. Again, just to kind of bring all the colors into the same family. I knew that I was going to darken this up quite a bit. So I want it to have a little bit more of a utilitarian look, and I want it to feel like the details are what makes it pop a little bit more. So I already have an idea for how I'll do the highlight details, so that I can have a little bit of color in them as well. Yeah, we're doing good. So, let's switch over to black real quick. Um, obviously, it's more of a dark gray, but I want to bring some of these values down a little bit more. Sometimes when stuff is too saturated, it can come across as cartoony. And we gotta be careful. So, a moment here, I'll clean out the airbrush. And we'll switch colors. And stir. Aww. What's that? Alan says, sounds like you two work really well together. Nice. We do work well together. Thanks so much for your time today. Much appreciated. Enjoy the rest of your weekend and stay safe and cool. Shall do. Yeah, thank you for coming along. You have Bye. a good day as well. Bye. I'm going to switch over to a little bit of black here. Again, gonna test this guy. Make sure it's working. Now this black has a little bit of blue in it. And what I want to do is just richen up some of these areas a little bit. Airbrushing with gray is uh, can make things look a little bit muddy. And naturally, this is gonna have way more punch and way more contrast. Can be a good thing. And it also helps kill in some of that blue. The saturation's up a little bit high. Um, and we want some of it. If I was rendering this black, that wouldn't be so bad, but because it's really more of like a dark silvery gray, we don't want it to have too much punch. Because um, otherwise it'll read a little bit incorrectly. I mean, for the sake of something quick and conceptual, it's not, certainly not make or break. <laughs> What's that? Your wife needs a mic. <laughs> Can you guys not hear that well? I mean, I'm, my face is like inches from the uh, uh, camera, which has the mic built in. We actually were trying to find a mic yesterday that we could just have in the middle of the room so that we could both talk and hear everybody. So, yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, I, I did order one. It's not going to come for a few days, so uh, I need it specifically for uh, voiceover classes I'm taking, and I'm trying to do more voiceover stuff on my own. So I, I ordered the equipment. It's, it's going to take a, a little bit of time to get here. Yeah, I'm sure it'll be here by the time we want to do the next live video. I need to speak up then. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that. Like I said, I am right next to the mic, like right next to it. Probably too much. So I'm just kind of taking some transparent black and bringing everything down a little bit to where I feel like it's balanced. Because at this point, I'm looking, I've got all the marker done, or at least most of what I'm going to do marker-wise. And so I'm just trying to get to the airbrush to the stage where I think the rest I can achieve with highlights. So that's kind of a, a delicate balance as well. And a color like uh, silvers or grays require a really delicate balance, whereas something like a, a red or a black, it reads finished very easily. 
gonna go over some of this dark stuff a little bit because what I have in the airbrush is the darkest color I'm gonna use. And yep, so I'm gonna get this core color a little bit darker here and then I'll switch colors one more time. Nice, definitely look a little bit better because I was really more imagining more of a, a dark gray than a silver. We're finally getting there. Cool. All right. So I'm actually gonna darken this up just a little bit more in here. Again, just kind of looking at the balance of everything, going back and forth until I feel like everything is where it needs to be. Because there's a lot that I'm gonna do in highlight because um, I prefer prefer the way some of that stuff looks. If I need everything to be perfectly crisp, then I would just do it with um I would mask everything out a whole lot more. But that's not super fun. And while the end result is better, to watch it is absolutely hard. It's slow. <laughs> yeah. But that'd be a good video to do sometimes because the masking technique, especially on paper, can be a bit specific. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So real quick, what I'm going to do is grab a little bit of organic yellow and airbrush that over top of some of the lower stuff to bring the yellow up a little bit. Because um, at this stage, there's still a little bit that I want to do with marker, but um, I don't want to go over all the airbrushing with marker, because then I'll start unbalancing it all over again. Alright. Uh, Corey wants to know if you take requests. Can you paint some Dunlop tire letters on the tires? <laughs> I'm sure I could. I might do I might do a lot of the finishing work of this one after the feed is over, or after we're done for the day. So I might do something like that. And Max B said, "Nice, saludos from Chile, yay!" Hello from Southern California. Hopefully your weather's nicer than ours right now. <laughs> a little warm here. At least for now. Yeah. So I'm doing is taking this organic yellow and kind of going over the warm areas a little bit, bringing the saturation up so it's not quite so muddy. Um, and then of course, bouncing that into the lower areas. So there's quite a bit of back and forth work, to, at least to the way that I work, so that I can kind of get this look that I like. And that's pretty much about got it as far as the airbrushing goes. We don't need a lot of this warm all over the place. And I'm gonna keep the wheels pretty neutral. Alright, so I'll do a little bit of yellow, just a little bit over the tires here, just so that they feel like they're coming up from the ground a little bit, maybe just a teeny bit on the tire, just to kind of get a good color shift. It's nice to have something that's a little warm next to something that's a little bit cool, just so they stand out from each other a little bit better. There'll be a lot of detail work with this that has to be done with uh, colored pencils or paints just to kind of sure up the edges and the details. So, got my brush here. This is acrylics, so everything that I've already done is already dry. Yay. Which is great. Materials that allow you to work fast. You know, uh, every bit of that <laughs> helps the workflow, which is awesome. Let me see if I can find a decent enough eraser here. One of the things that I wanted to grab while, while we were out yesterday, and we're not able to. I didn't think we'd be out of erasers, but here we are. Bear with me just a moment. Do you think they'd be open today, or probably not? What's that? The art store. There's no reason to go all the way that far. I could have gone, gone to Office Depot and got what I needed. Oh, yeah. But, uh, that's okay. Where it is? Sorry, missing something. Give me just a moment here, guys. Sorry. I'm talking to my mom. Hmm, very nice. Very nice, very nice. Let's switch out. I'm calling and I told her we were recording. Yeah. 
So I'm going to do real quick, or at least at this stage, one of the ways you can start to highlight is with an eraser. That might seem a little bit odd, but what they call this is subtractive highlighting, because you are literally subtracting the airbrush paint from the paper. But you couldn't erase marker, that's for sure. So this won't work if you're just doing marker. But this is part of why I like to leave a lot of space for the airbrushing to happen, because the way details and highlights happen is a big part of getting the visuals correct. Now if you go too heavy with airbrush, um, or mix it too strong, you won't have enough space left to do some of these really cool subtractive highlights. And some of this stuff will have to be painted, painted in a little bit more rigidly. And that's fine. Each kind of has its own step. But I like to be able to do these kind of soft, removable highlights. Sean's leaving. He said, great work, guys. Love it. Hey, thanks very much. Have a good day. Thanks, Sir Sean. All right. It's kind of pulling some highlights out here, I said, with the, uh, with the eraser, which is cool. You could also do this with, like, colored pencil or something, but this is softer, less grain. Yeah, let's see, I'll pull these areas back a little bit. Some of this I will do with paintbrush or, um, or color pencil. Just depends on the look of the area that I'm working in. Let's see. Bring this up a little bit more. A lot of this stuff will have to be painted in highlights, which is just cool. It'll help. It'll really help do the thing. And yeah. All right. Hey, we'll see you on the next one. All right. So we're we're an hour twenty-two in. This is actually a great point to stop. It's a little bit warm in here, so I'm having to contend with that a little bit with the paints and the paper. Uh, so we're going to get out of here for today. I'm going to finish this up today, though, and I'm going to post it on Instagram. So, uh, yeah, thank you guys for coming along. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday, and we'll see you on the next one. Bye, guys.